Hi guys, this is Otter here. It's a Sunday night and I had some time on my hands so I decided to do a how to make Warhammer 2 better video. Everyone likes going up on a soapbox every once in a while. I guess uh, this is my opportunity to do that so bear with me. I'm going to go through a list of 20 suggestions that I think could make uh, the game better. There's not a particular order to this other than I think it flows. Although I will say some of the earlier items I just want to get out of the way. They may be less important. If you stick uh, with me towards the end of the list, you'll probably see some of the more uh, relevant suggestions. But I think they're all relevant in their own way. So I hope you uh, I hope you find it interesting. I don't think you will agree with me on necessarily all of them, but you don't necessarily have to. I think the idea is to provoke discussion, get the community thinking, and um, if I get my uh, my my wishes. Hopefully this will at some point trickle down to the developers and uh, maybe make them, uh, you know, consider some, some, some ways to improve the game. So that was a big preamble. Let's get into it. Suggestion number 20. Um, I'm going to start off with the campaign and some of the major things about it. I don't play a ton of campaign, but I have spent, you know, I've spent some hours playing it. And there's certain things that I would like to see uh, change. Um, I'm a multiplayer uh, guy first and foremost and it's fantastic that Warhammer offers you the option to um, play a multiplayer campaign you have the it's great you can play a head-to-head -head campaign or you can play a co-op the problem that I have with the current format uh, is twofold number one if I play a head-to-head -head campaign with a partner I cannot see their screen while they are doing their turn that means for five minutes or ten minutes or whatever it amount of time it is that they're doing their thing i'm zoning out i'm on youtube i'm on uh the browsing the internet whatever it is and i'm not paying attention to what my partner's doing and then when it's my turn uh, i have to sort of refocus into the game because i've been like not really paying attention for the last five or ten minutes most likely and it can cause delays and and break the flow of the game and it's it's, it's not ideal number two is i want to be able to play uh, with more than one person at a time. If you've ever played the game Risk, it is an amazing game. You have a big world map and you can have, you know, five, six people playing the game. Warhammer map in Total War is not unlike this. Uh, you have many, many factions, so why can't you have more than two people playing multiplayer at the same time? To me, that's a no-brainer thing. It, it doesn't I'm not a programmer, but it doesn't seem like it'd be very hard to implement. So I don't understand why it's not possible to have three players involved in a co-op or in a head-to-head -head or co-op campaign or four players or five players or six players or however many players want to play. I don't know what the limit is in terms of practicality. I'm, this is not a technical analysis. This is a you know wish list analysis, but I think it's something that needs to be done. And... Um, I really, really hope that that's going to come in new games. And I think even in Three Kingdoms, I, I don't quote me on this, I don't play a lot of Three Kingdoms, but I think the same issue uh, applies there. And so it doesn't look like that issue has been identified, and I don't think it it's going to be retroactively implemented in Warhammer unless, you know, unless people, rec you know, see this video or, or the community starts talking about it and asking for it. Number two, this end turn timer, it sucks. Uh, people have complained about it. I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's got to be faster. Please, thank you. Next, number 18. Um, so I don't know if you've played you know, Resident Evil or uh, Tomb Raider or other games like this, or even, even Counter-Strike Go, which I'm going to talk about a lot as, as a frame of reference in this video because it is a very successful multiplayer game. But there are often a series of challenges that you can compete uh, in a co-op fashion. Um, so, for example, you know, maybe in Resident Evil, you have to kill a certain number of zombies in a, in a limited amount of time, or you have to reach the end, of, you know, the other side of the map, or something like that. And um, I think in Warhammer, uh, you know, once you've beat the campaign, uh, or once you've played, let's even say multiplayer. I mean, there, there's 
I think there's an opportunity to create some scripted scenarios where you have like challenge missions or whatever uh, to to sort sort of beat an AI faction. So so for example, like in CS:GO, there there are wing wingman uh, missions you can do where you partner up with a buddy and you have to kill a certain number of AI um, within a time limit or whatever it might be. And I think that is absent. Or, or survival mode or something like that and that that is absent right now from warhammer total war something that i think could be considered uh i think you know there's a lot of ways of doing that and and i think a little bit of creativity could sort of push the development of a few challenge scenarios number 17 uh i i just want to talk about the map select here I think if you've noticed, they've started to make some minor improvements to the interface. You have seen the the Steam launcher get, or sorry, the Total War launcher get changed. Uh, I think people, a lot of people have commented on the UI. Basically, what I want to say here is the listing of the maps is terrible. There's probably like 150, 200 maps right now. Uh, there's listed alphabetically, but a lot of the a lot of them start with the words like the, for example, and so like maybe it's called i don't know let's just pretend it's the alpine ridge well you might think okay alpine ridge and you go look alphabetically under a and try and find alpine ridge surprise it's not there it turns out it's under t for the and you have to go down to t and the and to find it so that's a little bit confusing number two you have five uh, mp maps here the game's been out for a long time i think we need to either designate more mp maps or we need to remove this mp designation because uh after two three years we only have five mp maps it seems very silly to me i know there are other maps that are out there like the maruka isles for example to me they seem like balanced mp maps so why don't they have an mp designation and by the way mp what does that even mean i i mean i think it means multiplayer but maybe there should be an icon or something that's that indicates you know this is a tournament ready map or this is a multiplayer map like but it's, it's really it's really random the other thing i want to talk about with respect to this is if you look at the faction select screen now they've reorganized it so you have uh like in the multiplayer you have the groupings where you have like norska factions all together and then you have the empire factions all together and then you have the dark elf factions all together so when you're selecting it's sort of already sorted and i think they could still make the filters better like it's faster to find your faction because it's still a pretty intimidating list but i think that problem is even compounded with the map selection and what i would like to be able to do is let's say thematically you know i'm playing a game as a dark elf against another uh, a dark elf player i don't know whatever i don't want to have to like search through hundreds of maps and try and pick out the 10 dark elf maps i want to be able to click a button and f have a filter you know get rid of all the other maps that aren't dark elf maps and then what only displays on this list is a dark elf map or i want to have some sort of well in addition to that i probably want to have some sort of an icon that maybe shows me at a glance uh, you know what type of map this is going to be there should be a few different icons that tell me what type of map this is going to be uh is it a heavily forested map is it a uh, map with the hills is it a map with uh a, like i said a dark elf map whatever like there's, there should be a certain number of icons that let you f see at a glance what the map is without me having to specifically click on you know mp peak uh pass and then analyze the map and and uh you know kind of infer from there I should know without having to click on the map the basic top level information about it. Number 16. Since I'm still ranting about these uh this this map selection screen, I think it's really really important. Um there is a glaring weakness with these this map select screen, which is that the deployment zones and the vanguard zones are not indicated when you do your multiplayer select. That is not acceptable these that is if you are planning a battle that is absolutely critical strategic information for you to know can i can i vanguard or not because that will determine whether or not you buy vanguard units for your army and and then secondly you know am i deploying on the top of a hill am i deploying at the bottom of a valley should i bring artillery should i not bring artillery like this is important information to know and because there are hundreds and hundreds of maps, unless you are like a hardcore multiplayer, you're not going to have it memorized like all of the different maps. And I just ran a tournament this past weekend where we had some top tier players playing on a map that they weren't as familiar with. And they had to say 
timeout term tournament organizer. Do you mind if I leave the lobby, go back, load the game on my own screen, and look around the map just to figure out how to navigate around the map? To me, that's ridiculous. They should not have to do that. They should be able to look at the image of the map, they see the vanguard, see the deployment zones, and say at a glance whether or not it's a fair map or not. I shouldn't have to guess if a map is balanced uh, or have players say, okay, wait, I have to, I have to go off on the side and, and investigate myself before I'm willing to agree to play this match. Next, uh, number 15. Uh, there's a lot of... So, so, okay, there are so many maps. They are fantastic in the sense that they are colorful, they are beautiful, they are very well designed. The graphics artists in Total War Warhammer 2 and Total War Warhammer 1 have created some of the most visually stunning, uh, imaginative maps I, I, I've ever seen. And it really does create an immersive atmosphere and get you in the spirit of the game. Congrats, developers. You kicked ass on that one. Now, where I have an issue is that half of those maps are not even usable in the multiplayer circuit. And I will give you the example of the minor settlement battles or the, or the siege battles. The obvious weakness of this is when you are setting up you can see in the deployment phase, if you're the defender, your attacker's army. You can see exactly the positioning of your attacker, which if you're playing a multiplayer game, a human against human, that it gives you such a strategic advantage that it renders the map useless. And therefore, if you're playing uh, and trying to recruit people to your lobby, no one's going to join a map that's a minor settlement battle or a siege battle for, for in most cases for that specific reason that needs to be changed i don't want to see my opponent's deployment i want to be surprised please fix it seems like a straightforward fix now i touched on the siege battles earlier uh and i know siege battles have taken a lot of flack in total war warhammer uh 2 a lot of people like, you know, the bigger uh, siege battle environment that was characteristic of some of the historical titles, and you've seen a reversion to that in, uh, you know, Three Kingdoms. I, I, I empathize with that. I don't think the siege battles are as bad as people made them out to be. I think there were some really cool things that they did with them. I, I actually really liked the cities and the climbing of the walls. I thought that was, that was really cool, you know? Um, but... There, there, there's two two main problems with with um, the siege battles, and the first problem that I I, I have experienced is the uh, unit funds. It forces you to bring a certain amount of imbalanced unit funds between the attackers and defenders. So the attackers always get, and I don't know how they determine this, but like an additional 25% of funds or whatever. And what you can see on screen here is maybe it's not, you know, super, super clear, but like, let's say I'm the attacker playing the Blessed Dread going against the High Elves. I'm going to get 12,400 gold versus my defenders, 8,680 gold. It's not fair. The attacker is going to win that battle 90% of the time, uh, assuming equal skill levels or, or more, more than 90% of the time for that reason alone. It is much, much harder to play defense than it is to play offense on a siege battle map. The second thing about a siege battle map is it's way, way, way too easy to bring flyers in a siege battle map. Now you can have a friendly agreement with your opponent, uh, say, okay, well, we're going to restrict to a certain number of flyers, but like the fact that you can bring flyers in a siege battle map uh, can render the game stu like completely stupid because you, you wow whoop de doo you have walls well what if I just fly over your walls and go to the capture points or kill whatever it is on the other side of the wall it renders the walls obsolete that's why I think there have to be some restrictions about the number of flyers that are available to people on a siege battle map number thirteen we've talked about minor settlement battles and siege battles. The next obvious target is free-for-alls. Uh, I like free-for-alls. It's a great, great concept. Uh, but it is so forced the way they've set it up. It, it requires four teams for you to be able to play. That means if you have three friends, or sorry, yourself and two other friends, or like three people who want to play a game, uh, you're not allowed to play a free-for-all free battle. That makes no sense to me. Why, why should I not be allowed to play a, th a three-man free-for-all battle? Um, or... Why should I not be able to play a two-person free-for-all battle? Because that would give me access to an additional 20 maps. 
even though it's called free for all it, i don't see any reason why you can't just have a one-on-one -on, -one on a free for all map please fix that i want to be able to play on those maps there's some really cool free for all maps that i've never been able to really uh use to their full potential let's say and so yeah come on easy fix number 12 i'm not original in saying this uh but i think it's really important and i want to underscore uh just how important it is and color man it, it matters this game has its origins warhammer on the tabletop people spend years painting their armies sometimes to get them just picture perfect there's a golden demon painting competition for people who can paint the best army um a large part of the hobby in fact arguably more of the hobby is about painting your army than it is about actually playing the game i have a daughters of cain army i spent a year painting it i've played maybe three months in terms of the amount of time I've played actually moving pieces around on the battletop and rolling dice versus the amount of time I've painted my army, I can tell you I've dedicated way more hours to painting my army than actually playing it. Not everyone is the same, but a lot of people are like that, and some people even prefer the painting over the gaming. To me, it's a balance. All that to say, I think that there needs to be an option for people to customize the colors of their factions, and I think... Uh, there's there are ways to uh, incentivize people or, or to make it possible for people to do this, which will, I think, transition to my next point, which is about uh, customizability and, and microtransactions. People need incentives to play the game if you want to build a large community. There are, for any game you produce, there's going to be a certain number of die hard hardcore fans who are just going to play the game and they don't give a fuck about, um, you know, uh little little extra incentives but there's a lot of sort of casual gamers where you need to entice them to continue to to playing and and in my opinion microtransactions are the way to do that now i know a lot of people find it controversial uh because they're like well it's just another way for developers to sneak money but the reality is uh games cost money to produce uh if they're going to have a shelf life and there's going to be renewal of the game there are different ways of doing that but the developers require access to ongoing uh funds to uh allow the game to continue to grow and not just is and not just die microtransactions are the answer to that you can release a lot of dlcs but you hear the com community complaining about oh well i don't want to buy a three dollar you know blood for the blood god um dlc and there's so many complaints about that and it's a very divisive issue in the community well if you want the game to continue to grow, another way you can do it is with microtransactions. You allow people, if, okay, so I've got a couple of images on screen. I haven't really talked about them before, but look here, Felhart. He's got red blades. They look fucking awesome. What if I want to have yellow blades for look here, Felhart? Maybe if I play a certain number of games or if I become at the top of the leaderboard or whatever, I should be able to get access to yellow blades. These are not, it's not like an RPG where I'm suggesting that his blades become stronger, um, you know, if you unlock them, I, I, I don't want, I don't want to make, I don't want the game to be, to require investing a ton of hours so that you can compete on the same level. What I'm saying is just cosmetic changes that should be uh, accessible and, 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 and unlock as, as people play the game. And then, you know, obviously with the microtransaction money in CSGO, if you trade an item with another player, or if you purchase an item on, on their marketplace, then there's a certain cut of that purchase that goes back to either Steam or Valve or whatever developers are. And that money, it adds up over time and it allows the developers to produce new content, to produce new items. Uh, it gets the community engaged and there's always something to aspire to. Like players want to unlock the new item. Developers want to, um, you know, uh, develop. They have they have a reason to develop new items because, uh, you know, it keeps people engaged and, you uh, and so on. So CSGO, it came out in maybe 2012. Oh yeah, Overwatch is another example. Like So before I, I move on, Overwatch, you, you can unlock skins, you can unlock new voice lines, emotes, you can unlock new animations, you can unlock victory poses. Um, there's different sprays, so, you know, recoloring of your thing. Uh, there's different highlight intros for when you select your army, uh, different types of weapons. So there's all these different ways you can customize your character um and and that can unlock as you play the game 
And these don't, like, so Mercy, she's a healer in, in, in Overwatch, right? It's not like you become stronger if you unlock new emotes or voice lines or whatever. But if I, if let's say I really like playing Mercy, you know, I'm going to play a lot of games in order to be able to get access to those things. I'm not going to dwell on that any anymore. I assume that if you play video games, you're very familiar with the concept of, of microtransactions. Um, but yeah, I think it's something that needs to be uh, in, worked into a Total War uh, game because it, it does give longevity and uh if you look on the steam charts like a lot of the most successful games do have these sort of microtransactions or do have access to uh you know these these um sort of unlocking uh incentivizing things counter-strike go and dota i think they both have it well i know for sure they both have it counter-strike go came out in about 2012 i think dota was somewhere around the same time i took this screenshot today and in terms of the number of current players, Counter-Strike Go is number two. And that I think that just really underscores, underscores the longevity that, that these types of things can bring to a game. And it's not about, I don't think it's about, you know, well, shooters are more popular or, you know, um, whatever those, I forget what you call the Dota games. But uh, it's, not, it's not, I don't think it's about the genre of game. I think it's really about the mechanics of the game and the way of, of motivating people to play. If you study psychology... Um, you'll know that the, there are different types of reinforcement schedules. And the most strongly reinforcing schedule, it, it, like, you know, this is why gamblers get addicted to, 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 you know, pulling slot machines and stuff, is a variable reinforcement schedule. So you, you can have certain drops and things like that, that that show up in the game based on a variable reinforcement schedule that gets people to play. Enough on that. Number 10. So if you play League of Legends or these other games, you'll realize that there are actually more than one sort of queue uh, systems that are in place. You can do like a solo queue, you can do a duo queue, you can do a flex queue, a normal queue, blind pick. So I've, I've taken this from a, this screenshot on the right of a website and it, the, the, the point is just to illustrate you know, that there's, there's more than one ways of doing things. And if you look at the Total War Warhammer 2 uh, menu, there's quick battle. So first of all, that's confusing. What the hell is quick battle? I don't even understand what that is. If I'm a new player, um, you know, how is quick battle different from multiplayer battle? Well, it turns out if you actually do click pa quick battle and you play a game, you're going to show up somewhere on the leaderboard and then quick battle is actually the leaderboard or the competitive battle or the closest thing that to it that exists in Total War Warhammer 2. Um, but not everyone wants to play competitive all the time and sometimes they do want to be able to play a quick battle if i play uh, csgo and i click you know start it will it can randomly insert me to a game but i have an option i can play casual or i can play competitive and that separation does not exist in the total war warhammer 2 um quick battle option so i think really they need uh, as a bare minimum two different quick battle cues they need one that will just randomly throw you into a game and it'll be like you know competitive or or, or sorry it will be like casual whatever it's not going to show up on any leaderboard it's just a way for you to practice fast and then the other should be you know the competitive you click that competitive it's going to show up on the ladder it's going to be reflected in your rank and so on another idea too is like some, maybe i want to play with different friends right like if i do a duo queue right uh, I think there needs to be a separation, and, and again, this is shown here, but I, I want to underline, like, there needs to be a separation between my ladder ranking as a single player versus my ladder ranking as a dual player. There are players who let's I want to play with who I know are less skilled than me, or that I know are more talented than me, and then let's say I'm playing with someone who is less skilled than me, just for the sake of argument. Uh, if if I'm playing with them, potentially I'm handicapping myself because I could end up playing at a lower, uh, I, I could end up with a, a, a ranking on the leaderboard lower than my true skill level. And so I might say to my friend, well, you know, I don't really want to play with you because you can't keep up. You can't keep up to my skill level. That's not really fair. It's not really fun for my friend. Uh, and it, it sort of discourages a lot of opportunities to play with people. Maybe I want to have one partner who I play with. So I have like, you know, the Otter and Mr. Awesome uh, duo. 
that should show up at one place on the on the on the leaderboard and then i should have another listing for why i otter and mr not so awesome that shows up somewhere else on the leaderboard like why can't one person have two listings on a leaderboard with different teammates you know so i'm, I'm, I'm saying this whole quick battle notion needs to be reworked and uh hopefully that gets done sooner there's a lot of ways of doing it but the one size fits all quick battle not doing it next talking about the quick battle when you ready up this is the information that warhammer gives you it says looking for a match and there's a little spinning icon and you just sit there and hope that at some point in time someone's going to join and there is there's no information beyond that and uh there you know warhammer doesn't have some of like the, the super large community that some of these other games have i think in part because of these issues um and you might be waiting for a little bit longer than uh than you should be and at that point you might say well how long am i going to be waiting here i don't see the like if you if you go buy some groceries right and you're standing in the grocery line you can say, okay, there's five people ahead of me. Once they've cleared through, I'm going to be able to get to the cashier. I'll, uh, uh, the cashier is going to take my groceries and I'm going to pass through the line. And so you can judge, okay, well, it's worth waiting that amount of time or not. That doesn't exist here. You just, you're in an arbitrary line of an undetermined length uh, in Warhammer. And so a lot of players will be like, well, I'm not willing to wait for this uncertain duration of time. And that's even worse if you're playing a 2v2 like uh, uh if you're trying to get a 2v2 match on quick battle and actually i think it's become dead for that reason because people tend well and for the reasons that I, I mentioned earlier on point number eight but uh if you try and do a duo queue uh you could be waiting for an hours before you find an opponent and um you don't know if it's worth continuing to wait CSGO, they have uh, a system that's informing you all the time while you're in queue how things are going. They say, okay, we're searching for players. So far, two out of five players have accepted this match. Uh, you know, once the match is ready, we want you to click the accept button to make sure that you are actually there and the, the game doesn't just start while you're zoning out and browsing YouTube or whatnot. Uh, and then they're, they're telling you even more information, you know, estimated search time, number of players online, how many people are we pooling from? Uh, you know, how many servers are there? Uh, we, we, they're, they're telling you, okay, what maps did you select? What game mode are you in? Like, and, and I have control when I'm, before I even join the queue about which maps I'm willing to play on. There's a lot of people who, when they're playing multiplayer, they're going to end up playing on a map that they don't even like. They know it's imbalanced. I can tell you there are a few multiplayer maps that I don't like, and it will put me into a lobby with someone on a map I don't like, and I'll say, you know, it's, it's not fair. There's no reason for me to play on this map, and I'll have to queue dodge and then re... In, well, I'll have to dodge the lobby, close the lobby, and then re-enter the, the queue in the quick battle and hope that the next time that I get randomly assigned to a map, it's not the same map that I, I thought was imbalanced in the first time around. In CSGO, you can choose which maps you're willing to play on. Let's say the only map I like playing on in, C in CSGO is Dust2. That's the most popular map if anyone plays CSGO. So I can deselect all the other maps, and then when I enter competitive circuit, it will only allow me to play on Dust2. In Total War Warhammer 2, there's no similar option to that. And I think there needs to be a designation of which maps in the Warhammer circuit should make the competitive list, and then of those 10 or 15 maps let's say i can i could choose which ones i'm willing to play on and then that's that that uh, that avoids that whole oh you you've ended up on a stupid map and and, and you got to dodge and re-enter the queue kind of thing number 8 uh what you will find in games that have a smaller community is the potential for uh sinking and what do I mean by this? So I'm going to give you the example of Guild Wars. It's one of my favorite games from when I was a kid. Fantastic game if you if you had ever played it in its heyday when it had a really large community. And they had this they had this thing called random arenas, right? And so the idea was that like a quick battle, you click start and it would assign you to a random team, and then 
you would have to play up against other teams that had been randomly assembled. But the problem was, as the community got smaller and smaller and smaller, because just the game aged and that's the natural thing that happens, people realized that if they you know, said to their friend, okay, you press the start button at the same time that I press the start button, the odds are really high that we're going to end up on the same team. So all of a sudden, what was supposed to be random arenas ended up being a whole bunch of teams that were truly random versus a team that was uh, that was synced. And the sync team, obviously, because they had coordination or experience or whatever, usually was going to win and they would beat the crap out of everyone else. Uh, so basically what I'm getting at is that you're going to have certain sort of uh, match rigging. And in terms of the Warhammer 2 leaderboard, because there's not a ton of people, if I press quick battle at the same time as my friend quick presses quick battle, and I let my friend... Uh, and my friend agrees to deliberately lose 30 matches in a row versus me, uh, and 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 I dodge, I Q dodge versus all of the other opponents in, in in the in the cases that I happen to match up with them. Then I can artificially inflate my ranking on the leaderboard and put myself close closer to the top. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed, especially if the community starts to dwindle and there are fewer players uh, involved, because that can skew the leaderboard dramatically. Next, I want to talk about the uh, points or the, the, the way that Army Select works. I think it's fundamentally flawed in the, in the current Warhammer 2 system. I, playing, I play Age of Sigmar tabletop, and I really, really love the way that they've, they've structured the Army Selection. So I don't know if you can see super clear here, but they have, like, this is, this, if you go to War Squirrel Builder, com or whatever war squirrel builder though it's it's a system that allows you to select your army and you basically pick all your units on there and it'll it'll tally it up to give you a point total and you can use that for competitive play with tabletop and the way that it works is you have to have a certain number of like they're they're caps maxes right you have a, you can have up to a maximum of six heroes they call them leaders here or you can have a maximum of four behemoths so that would be your like cauldrons of blood or your dragons or whatever or a max number of artillery but they also and i think this is the key and important part have a minimum number of battle line units that you are required uh to take so if i am playing a let's say a dark elf army that would mean that I would need to take a minimum of three bleak swords or three dread spears or th three whatever whatever it is what, dark shards right those are considered a certain number of units will have a battle line designation and you're required to take a minimum number of them and why is that important because if you play a lot if you play a, a game against someone who brings all individual entities that are highly mobile spreads them out all over the all over the map and has no front line for you to engage with. Uh, and then they just bring a whole bunch of vortex spells or a whole bunch of whatever, then, and you happen to be the the you know good-hearted man who brought you know an actual front line, you're never going to be able to reach and catch and pin those individual units. And if they spread them all over the map and are mobile, as you go and attack one or two of them, they can kite and shoot and shoot you, or they can uh, use point of focus to consolidate and attack your, your flanks and, and basically eat up your army. And, it, and it's very one-sided, imbalanced fight. I run into it occasionally when I play on ladder. It's, in my opinion, just as bad as uh, corner camping with artillery. Uh, I do like to play highly mobile uh, play styles, and I understand. I think there is a place for highly mobile play styles, but I think it also has the potential for abuse. And as much as I will slag on dwarf players, and, and I will slag on dwarf players for uh, just turtling, uh, I think the uh, other end of the uh, spectrum also deserves to be slagged on. And uh, there, there are ways to fix it. I think there's a lot of wisdom in, in, in the tabletop game. It's been out for 40 years. Uh, so I think that wisdom needs to be heated, and uh, hopefully that, that's something that would be considered. Number six, speaking of slagging dwarfs, they have no place in the game. I hate dwarfs. All their beards should be cut. Just kidding. But sort of... <laughs> I don't, nobody likes dwarves except for dwarf players, in which case they love them. Um, and also, so the, but but really the reason I'm bringing this up is to transition to the next point, which is uh, nobody likes uh, factions that can just sit still, do absolutely fuck all, 
and win the game. And in tournament play, uh, often the rules are that you have to be like attacking. And if you are playing a faction that has ultra defensive units that are not mobile at all and have no obligation to really move, and the uh, the attacker is obliged because of the tournament rules or whatever to literally slam their face into your brick wall, like your ultra defensive units, then it can cause uh, a really frustrating imbalance in the game. Dwarf players love it, obviously, because they're winning, but on the other side of the equation, it's, it's, it can be really frustrating and discourage a lot of people from playing other more mobile factions. I know it's a, it's a challenge to balance uh, the defensive nature of dwarves. They should be stalwart. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of playing dwarves. But there's a fine balance between being stalwart and literally doing fuck all and sitting in a corner and, and still winning the game without having to have had to move at all. And that's, it's really frustrating. It's not fun to watch. It's not fun to play against. And it's not fun to um, play as. I, I don't, at least not for me. Other people might love it. But So how do we fix this? Uh, do we make the dwarves super fast? Do we make them uh, you know, ultra mobile? Do we just verbally declare... Tisk tisk dwarf, you're not allowed to sit in the corner. Or tisk tisk dwarf, I'm going to require that all of your units are a minimum of 40 meters apart. Like in reality, it's not practical to enforce that in a game. There's a lot of subjectivity, and, and as a tournament organizer, that it's shit to do that. So, how do we fix it? Well, we do what they've done in tabletop. This, there's been a res resolution to this. We have objectives. We have capture the flag or capture the whatever or burn the marker or uh what we force people to move and actually do things therefore to win the game it is not possible to sit in one place you have to be able to respond to a certain number of objective markers on the field of play i'm not saying every game has to be like this some games should be perhaps straight up combat where you have to just delete the other army but if you look at a general's handbook, which is where they list the uh, the different scenarios for the tabletop game, like all of them require a certain objective play. And the way it works, you capture a certain number of points for being there for a certain period of time. Or maybe you, um, if you control both objectives beyond X amount of time, then the game automatically ends and a victor is declared. Like there's, there's so many creative, interesting, fantastic ways that you can bring replay value to a game and um, add so much complexity and nuance. And, and it's 100% it's absent in the current Total War Warhammer 2 format. So that's something that I think probably more than anything else on this list. If, I, if, if, if there was one wish list item that I have, like more than choosing your color schemes and all, this is it. I want to see objective play. I want to force people to move and, and have to prove that they can do more than just sit in one place and win the game just because their units happen to be stronger. Um, so please, please, please make it happen, Creative Arts. Find, find a way. Or Creative Assembly. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. Number four. Guys, this is like 2019. We're coming... We're halfway done 2019, almost towards 2020. Uh, we need integrated voice chat. If you play Overwatch, if you play CSGO, if you play any modern game, they have integrated voice chat. They even put it in Three Kingdoms. Why is it not in Total War Warhammer 2? I want the option to have it. It needs to be there. Uh, I don't want to have to be forced to use third-party software like Discord or Steam. Like they, I mean, they have their place. They are useful. But there needs to also be the option to have integrated audio within the game itself. Next up, Shift plus Enter to play, to talk to your team. It sounds trivial. It's a minor detail. It's so stupid. But it really matters. If you're a new player and you're trying to get into the Total War uh, multiplayer scene, the UI is so in unintuitive. Literally everyone who is a new player who is, hasn't played previous Total War titles is going to ask, well, how do I talk to my team? They should not have to ask that question. There should be an icon. There should be a talk to team button. Something very clear that indicates how do you talk to your team. This UI is terrible. It needs to be fixed. It needs a complete all overhaul. Uh, please change that. Please, please, please. 
Uh, next up, leaderboard. Uh, so if you if you look at the leaderboard, amongst the many problems that I've already indicated, there's a lot of players who are currently listed high on the leaderboard who may have played at the time of release. Maybe they had a lot of experience with other Total War titles. Uh, and they beat a bunch of new players who were just entering Warhammer for the first time or whatever. They vaulted to the top of the leaderboard, and since that time, since they're already top 10, there's no incentive for them to continue playing, and they just stop playing, and they're inactive. And you can look at them, like, I, I don't know, like, uh, I'm just pick a random name. Let's say Twitch Modus, Lotus Moon, number 14. I don't know. He, he could be at 504 wins for the past year and not have played a single game since then. I'm not saying that's the case, but hypothetically speaking, and he would still have his place on the ladder. And I think if you look to the model of other games, they have certain uh, uh, seasons uh, which sort of track how well people did over time. They give a chance for a fresh start for the leaderboard. If you did the best, let's say, at the beginning of Season 1, in the first year, let's say, of release of Total War Warhammer 2, you deserve acknowledgement. You deserve recognition for that. You should, it should say that you were top 10 or whatever it was uh, at the end of year 1. But, uh, but, but let's say I'm a, an amazing player. I've reached top 10. Uh, I don't want to fall out of the top 10. Why would I continue to play any more games, right? unless I happen to be really motivated to get them to number one, but then let's pretend that I'm number one. Why would I ever play another game if I have a 10-0 and perfect record and it's seated me number one? Uh, the, the way that you deal with this or encourage you know, good players to continue to play is you have seasons and you unlock certain rewards for finishing at the top of the, you know, each of the seasons. They should be a knowledge for, doing, for, for, for reaching the top but it should be something that requires a continued investment to continue to get that credit, in my opinion. And I'm just showing here a graphic. You know, this has been done. This is not a novel concept. It's been done in League of Legends. It's been done in Overwatch. It's been done in so many games. There needs to be a season's uh, incentive. Give people a fresh start. Give people an excitement, a reason to play on ladder. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about, and it sort of leaks into what I, I was talking about previously, is the, the idea of, of titles, of recognition, of showing people that you have the, the, the biggest dick around, um, or biggest vagina, whatever, whatever is your thing. You want, you want people to know, like, I'm, I'm the big poppy, I'm the, I'm the best at this game, right? And if you look at the Total War Warhammer 2 incentive system right now, uh, literally, okay, it's not like they don't have any sort of achievements. They do. They have Steam achievements. How many people in the tor Total War community know that I've unlocked the Tyranoc Charioteer achievement? Nobody gives a fuck. Zero people uh, are going to ever see that. No one's going to go on my, pre my Steam profile, scroll through hundreds of achievements, find the one achievement that may be actually impressive. Like, I mean, you get an achievement for building a building here. No one cares about that. Uh, what they care about is, you know, did this person finish in the top 10 in the leaderboard in the last multiplayer season? That's what I want to see in terms of achievements. And there's no way for someone to ever see that uh, unless they happen to be inspired to go to my Steam profile, scroll through all of my achievements, and see what I've done. Let me contrast that with other games. Let's look at uh, Guild Wars, for example. Again, this game was very, very successful at the time that it came out. They had a whole bunch of achievements. And when you had your character and you had customized your character and you are very proud of your character, in-game, you could click a button, it would display your title next to your character, and there were, there were tons of them, and people put in a lot of hours trying to unlock specific titles in order to be able to show them off to all of their friends. It wasn't that anyone had to go externally and be a friend of yours on Steam and then look up your profile and try and dig through titles and find which title you had. It was in their face. I'm very important. I'm kind of a big deal. And there were different tiers, right? And number six... I mean, God walking amongst mere mortals. If you're walking around the game with your character and you have that title showing, it's going to tell everyone you are a God walking amongst mere mortals because you've done some amazing, incredible things. And people, when they see you in-game, 
that's a conversation starter. They're going to be like, what? wow, how did you unlock that title? How many hours did you spend playing the game to be able to get to that point? Like, it, it gives players who want to play competitively the recognition that they... They, they're looking for that's the reason you play competitively usually i mean maybe there's an intrinsic motivation but i'm going to say like 90 percent of players want to be able to to, sh to show that if they're competitive and good that they are actually good and you know in, in the case of certain streamers you know they'll be, they will attract people to their stream on the assumption that they are good players or that on under the supposition that they are good players because people want to watch who's good at the game and if there's no way to demonstrate that then how can you show that you are a good player? How can you get people to watch your stream? How can you get people interested and engaged in the game or, 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 or aspiring to achieve a certain uh, accomplishment? And if you look, again, I, I gave the example of Guild Wars, a more contemporary example, if you play uh, League of Legends or if you play CSGO, there's a very specific set of titles that will appear. And I, I use CSGO because many people are familiar with it. You know, you have your Silver tier, you have your Gold Nova tier, you have your Guardian tier, and then at the top you can work towards Global Elite. There's very few people in the world that are Global Elite. It will say like point five percent of people in the world i mean maybe not in game but you can search for that actually attain attain the global elite title so if you have it and you're showing it in game it's very very prestigious and then the matchmaking is also if you join the random queue they will like bracket people into certain tiers so that the matches end up being fair which is something that's again entirely absent in total war warhammer 2 so i think that pretty much uh concedes my completes my rant right now on some major improvements that I would like to see in Total War Warhammer 2. Uh, if you agree with me, uh, awesome. Maybe you have more influence than me in the, in the community and you can start pulling on the, the legs or hair or whatever people pull on these days, the fingers, <laughs> chop some farts, I don't know, of the developers and, and see if, if we can get some or any of these uh, revisions implemented i don't think i mean obviously some of them i think are require more work than others and i'm not saying this is an exhaustive list but uh, i think there are some very tangible and meaningful improvements that could be made to this game and, and some of them i think are really really straightforward so please help me in, in getting that out there if you disagree with me maybe if i'm i'm off the beaten track on some comments please let me know i want to learn from my own uh misunderstandings drop a comment uh, hit me up on Steam, hit me up on Discord, and uh, I'm happy to talk about any of this with you and, and get more ideas or, or maybe refine the ideas that I've already put out there. Uh, it's clearly a subject that I'm passionate about because, uh, you know, more than a streamer, I'm a gamer myself, I love to play the game, and I want it to get better. Uh, and I don't want the game to die, you know? Like, if, if, you, don't, if you don't make improvements, uh, if you don't uh, continue to, to, to grow and continue to get not only, uh, you, you know, ongoing funds, to support the developers in the game, then the game dies, the community dies, and it, it's really sad. And, and I, I do think that what the what uh, Creative Assembly has, has has done with Total War Warhammer 2 is, is literally, in my opinion, created the best game of all time. And it needs to. Uh, I, I think it, it would be so tragic. It would be so sad to just let it go and not continue to improve it. And I think that maybe they're starting to realize there's some potential in the multiplayer scene but I, I still don't, i don't i'm not convinced that that message is fully sunk in yet at just how popular this game really could be if they were to address some of these issues thanks so much for paying attention why otter is out catch you around bye